Hi. Thanks so much for coming. My name is Steve Gravestock. I'm a senior programmer at the Toronto International Film Festival, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the film festival, uh, to the Bell Light, TIFF Bell Lightbox, and to this screening of Ron Mann's Carmine Street Guitars, which had its world premiere here at TIFF a couple days ago. To begin, we'd like to acknowledge that tonight's, uh, this afternoon's event is taking place in the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of uh, New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron Wendat. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community. I want to remind you guys this film is eligible for the Canada Goose Award for Best Canadian Feature Film, the Girls People's Choice Award, Girls People's Choice Documentary Award as well. Uh, vote for your favorite films at tiff.net slash vote. We'd like to thank Films We Like and The Match Factory for providing us with this film. Um, it's a real, uh, Ron's been unavoidably detained, but we're hoping he's going to be able to make the Q&A, so. Oh, actually. <laughs> I had something more elaborate prepared, but please welcome Ron Mann. <laughs> There's a benefit to having my office right across the street. Um, I actually didn't think I was going to do this because um, I want. I was in the first part of the sorry, first part of the festival. You know, you show your film, you do your intro, and then as a filmmaker, I want to see movies. So I was actually at uh, this changes everything earlier today, which is a really important film, and so, um, sorry, <laughs> um, I really ran here. Um, right, right, right. Okay. Uh, so, um, uh, for a lot of people, uh, uh, for a lot of people, when, they, when you think about Toronto film, you think about Rod Mann. That's the image that comes up. Uh, he has, um, he's, he was an important mentor to the Toronto New Wave. Uh, he's been, had a huge contribution, made a huge contribution to this festival with films like Imagine the Sound, Poetry in Motion, uh, Grass, uh, Compa Confidential, um, uh, just a slew of really great films. Um, and I think he's had a real impact in general uh, on, on filmmaking in the city. As I said the other night, Toronto was a lot less cooler before Ron Mann came along. Please join welcoming Ron Mann. Um, uh, I want to, there's two people here that really um, mean a lot to me. Um, John Tran, who's the cinematographer. That, um, I think you're here, John. Were you seeing another movie? There he is back there. And Chris Gall. Um, I, I worked with them on this film and on other films, and it's a it's a very intimate film. It's a small space, um, a guitar store in New York City. Um, this morning, um, my office is on Mercer Street, which is one street south of King, and they're beginning to tear down um, Medallion Labs. I don't know if people in the city know how important Medallion was, but David Cronenberg, the first 35 millimeter lab in Toronto, uh, run by Finn Quinn, um, they had the first solar panels to heat the chemicals of of the um, for the for the um, lab, and um, it's being torn down. <laughs> and um, it's kind of appropriate that I just sort of looked at that this morning, took photographs of it, and it's just kind of disappearing. And the reason I made this film was because of. Um, uh, you know, this is an artisan, a special place, and um, who's also, um, uh, it, you know, who is in the heart of Greenwich Village, which is changing. Um, I will be back here for a QA and a if you, if you want, um, if you could stay. But anyway, I hope you enjoy the film, and sorry for the brief rush to intro. intro. Stick around. We'll be back. Thanks for coming. Once again, please welcome Ron Mann. On time. <laughs> que <laughs> Questions? Go yeah, right there. Sure. The lady noted that uh, the instigator for the film or the spark for the film was Jim Jarmusch. Can you talk a bit about how it started? Sure. I was at a festival called Big Ears in Knoxville, Tennessee, and was hanging out with um, Jim, who's a friend, and Carter Logan, who's the executive producer of this film. And Big Ears is this really awesome festival. If people don't know it, it's avant-garde jazz and 
experimental music and Jim was there with his band called Squirrel and they were playing against Man Ray movies. Um, and what we noticed or what Carter and Jim noticed was that a lot of the musicians who were attending the festival had Kelly guitars. So Bill Frizzell was there. He was playing in front of uh, Bill Morrison's uh, documentary and uh, Steve Gunn was there <laughs> and um, they started talking about Kelly guitars I went who's Kel you know who's Rick Kelly and they and then I then we went to Nashville um, and where Jim was doing a live recording at Jack White's studio we all went out to dinner and they said you should make a film about Carmine Street guitars and um, it's not the first time Jim had recommended a movie to me, he um, is a f um, mycologist and recommended um, that I go down to the Telluride Mushroom Festival and I made a film called Know Your Mushrooms <laughs> because of that. Um, that's another story, but um, basically I walked into Carmine Street Guitars and I, um, I'm kind of one of those people that can't you know, goes to a bookstore, can't leave, goes to a record store, can't leave. And when I was in Carmine Street Guitars, it was like traveling back in time and I didn't want to leave. And met Rick and Cindy and, a, and musicians kept coming in and hanging out. And because of the connection with Jim, I kept thinking of coffee and cigarettes. And, you know, I had just seen Patterson, which is a really wonderful, soulful movie, which is a week in the life of poet and I thought oh well what about a week in the life of Carmine Street guitars and so that's how it all just kind of rolled um, he's a regular there the other thing about Jim is that he got Rick started on using um, uh, New York buildings uh, wood from New York buildings he was renovating his loft and brought into Rick um, wood from his from where he lives and that got um, which is a historical building, and that got Rick sort of thinking about, oh, well, like maybe I can get wood from Chumley's or from the Chelsea Hotel and that sort of thing. So, and one more thing about um, Jim that, that he said to me, which I thought was really super cool, was that he used to leave notes for musicians. So it operated like a post office. So he would leave messages for Patti Smith, and then Patti Smith would leave a message for... I don't know, Robert Quine. And so it was like this kind of real special community. And, you know, you walk around Greenwich Village. For me, Greenwich Village was always, you know, the folk scene or, you know, the, you know, in the early, in the mid 60s, it was, um, there were six guitar makers on that street and lots of record stores. Lenny Kay lives on Bleecker Street. Uh, sorry, I worked at Bleecker, Bleecker Bob's. And um, so it was kind of the center of kind of the music scene. And um, I have a romantic, you know, from Walt Whitman to Jack Kerouac and had still it was the center of this bohemian culture that I romanticized about. But it was really changing. You know, as we started filming it, um, there was an you know, Cindy went off on the first day to get lunch for Rick and she came back. She said, the noodle store is closed. And they had been going <laughs> to that noodle store for like 30 years and it just suddenly, you know, and it's turning into an upscale restaurant. So, um, yeah, and all those things are on my mind because I, as I said, I live right around the corner here and I live in this building since 1985 and I'm being thrown out for a condo. <laughs> so, um, you know, so it just comes out of my, all these things come out of like my passion, which is, you know, for guitars and um, for, but also for the people, places and the values that I see disappearing. And, um, yeah, and I'm, I'm living through it as well. Uh, we're, yeah, no, no, it's cool. If, <laughs> well, uh, yeah, as Rick said, you know, there's one in every office, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so I noticed that, like, of the subplot of the next door that property that the realtor came in and there's this kind of this disconnect, but then also with Charlie Sexton saying, my buddy's a real estate yeah. genius and he's rich and my biggest mistake financially was putting the ground in. So I wonder if you could flesh that out a bit, both like on the micro level, what happened with that subplot that kind of 
saw this property at this and that other factory. You should repeat it for me. The, the gentleman uh, is a is a real estate agent and a musician, so, uh, and he wanted to know if Ron could uh, elaborate on that sort of tension between real estate and yeah. commerce and, well, and Rick art. Would, Rick wouldn't be there if it wasn't for his landlady, who is a benefactor of the arts, and it's been in the it's been in three generations um, in her family, and just loves Rick. But otherwise, he would he wouldn't be there. And um, the real estate, the building was for when we started filming. I mean, John is I don't know if he's still here, but I mean, we we literally the, the you know sign went up while we were while we making the film, and um, the and the real estate agent um, is the real that's the real estate agent. And I just said walk in. It's a it's kind of an improvised documentary. Like there's. Um, you know, things just happened and the challenge was like, um, you know, we didn't know who was going to walk in. Um, I had no idea that Nels Klein was going to buy a, car, a guitar for Jeff Tweedy and I didn't know if uh, Kirk Douglas was even going to show up and, you know, um, and all these other, you know, these regulars just keep kept coming in. But on the real estate side, it was more like, um, you know, Rick is there because he, um, because of the landlady, the building did get sold, by the way, um, and as everything is turning over in, in Greenwich Village. Um, Mac, Matt Umanoz, which was around the corner, closed, but that was after 50 years he decided to, to, um, to close. But, and Rick is the last you know, man standing there, for sure. Um, yeah. yeah. So. Um, I wanted to say one thing about Rick. Those guitars are really cheap. Like, <laughs> I'm like, Cindy's trying to get him to raise the prices, but the reason why they're inexpensive is because he wants them played. He doesn't want collectors to like put it under a bed or in a closet. He wants them actually played. Like he's a like for me, Rick is like a modern day Thoreau. He was here. It's too bad, you know. He left. He just, you know. I mean, I got to tell you the story. I mean. He, the only reason he came to Toronto was for this movie, and he came very briefly. He hadn't left his bench in 30 years. Like, we had to get his passport. <laughs> like, you know, like, the guy just, like, builds guitars, and that's his entire life. Um, and he was just like, no, I got a text saying, I'm really happy I'm back. <laughs> just like, that's his thing, you know? He texted you? Yeah, no, no, Cindy. Cindy did. Texted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I forgot yeah. if that's true. He doesn't have a cell phone, and he's just like, but he's just, you know, he's one of those special guys, like that, you know, he's out of time. He's out of time. I once filmed uh, Robert Crumb um, for a movie I made about comic books, and um, it just reminded me of Robert Crumb. Actually, Robert, he reminded me of one of Robert Crumb's characters, like Mr. Natural, in a way, so. But it's just completely, yeah. And we would walk around Toronto, like pointing out, like, you know, oh, that building's like 18 something, and this is, you would point out all the wood. And it was just like, you know, it was just kind of marveled with, by everything. So, this gentleman, then we'll get the gentleman in the back. Go ahead. It's a wonderful movie, Ryan. Oh, oh Ivan. Uh, Hi. <laughs> it's, Hi. One of the extraordinary things that I would tell is how each musician made those Right, right. That's true. Yes, each. Uh, go ahead. My question was did you pitch any of these questions to the musicians or was it extemporaneous? Okay. Uh, the gentleman noted that each. Each musician got a different sound out of the guitars, but he also wanted to know if you uh, posed the questions to the musicians or did it just sort of develop? Well, I work with a, a wonderful writer. His name is Len Bloom. And Lenny Bloom um, uh, is a very, very dear friend, a guitar player as well. Um, and, and the first thing Len advised me was, don't do this movie, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I always go to Lenny. Um, and then, but he said, well, why don't you hang out and just kind of, you know, see what it's like. Um, um, and that's, that's what I did. And then, um, so what I, the way I work with Len is like we have a blueprint 
of what we're going to, what I'm going to do over the five days. And sometimes, you know, um, we wanted to, there's certain lines that we would try, you know, we would try to move the story along. And that happens sometimes after you film, um, where you're kind of knitting it all together. And, I've, and I can credit Robert Kennedy, my editor who I've worked with for years on that. Um, this is an absolute genius. So Robert and Lenny and I would kind of sit on, in the story level um, during post to actually sort of put it all together. Um, it With the scenes themselves, we would have... So I had no idea. Like, it might just be um, certain scenes that we knew... Like, I had no idea that Nels... I had a completely different, different um, scenario for Nels, Klein. And then he just spontaneously bought that guitar for, for Jeff. So we, we kind of throw out everything that we worked on, and in some cases. Um, but we, for, yeah, so it's kind of a mixture of, you know, kind of suggesting, you know, subjects that the artist would talk about, but we wouldn't write the lines, except at the very, at the po on the post side, we would kind of, you know, try to tighten it together that way. Um, and, uh, you know, the great thing about Rick and Cindy, they let us sort of come back, of, you know, of, because it took, even though it's, an, it's really an impression of a week, but it took, you know, about 20 days to actually shoot and put all together. But um, a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of Rick, just became warmer and warmer and warmer. Um, um, the conceit was to have the artist sort of bring things out of Rick, as opposed to like an interview, uh, interview illustration kind of a um, documentary. Um, I was very influenced by also Blue in the Face, which is a, 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 a film that uh, came out in, the, I guess, the late 80s. Yeah. It was like smoke and blue in the face. It was a variety store with Jarmusch and Lou Reed and Harvey Keitel. And we watched that together prior to making the film. And also um, Hero Dreams of Sushi, actually, was another film that we, because I thought, oh, well, sort of the same, but, you know, he just makes guitars <laughs> instead of sushi. <laughs> and he's not so much, he's, and it, but he's the opposite of a perfectionist. Like he leaves imperfections in, you know, and all that. And the other thing is once you start um, making the film, you start discovering a little bit about Rick. In other words, like I did not know about Rick's grandfather. It's just, I went out to dinner with um, a friend who, um, as a regular at the the store, and he started talking about you know those tools are like Rick's grandfather's. So um, it's just all these there's incredible things about Rick, like just even recognizing that w the resonant wood um, makes a difference in electric guitars it was something that he sort of um, came across and realized in the in in the seventies for acoustic guitars that's uh, that's it's common but not for electric guitars and the sa and it, the playing of the McSorley guitar is I always like I'm so moved by it the way that sounds um just also one more thing about Lenny Bloom. Um, L Lenny Bloom doesn't get paid to um, work with me, and I gave him the McSorley guitar. Nice. <laughs> I bought it for him. Um, and he's been playing it every day since he's had it. And yeah, he says it just sounds like it sounds great. I can't wait to hear him play Over the Rainbow or whatever on it. The gentleman at the back's been waiting for a while, so I'm afraid this is going to have to be the last one, but maybe. Sorry, yeah, I can. Go ahead. <laughs> no. Everyone heard that, right? No, none of it. That wasn't pre-planned. Um, um, you know, he cleans up every day. Um, so I wanted, I did sort of conceive of a, like a, you know, um, sort of ending. Um, 
in a way the film kind of ends for me that way um but it was it, it was very poignant like i've seen him just by himself play and um it's it, you know it's like so it's so beautiful. He's he, he calls himself a woodchuck more than a player, but he can play. He can play, and he can play. You know dulcimers and ukuleles, and you know. But he loves music. He adores Roy Buchanan. You know that he, he's just like he's so old school and just loves his. And I really connected with him over music as well like we both like Moby Grapes Naked If I Want To <laughs> it's like one of those like favorite songs of ours and, and I don't know you just can talk to him about um, music and he is a musical person and he does play but it's kind of private in a way for him and he's, he's not a yeah I mean the trick was to just get Rick to just you know be himself you know and that moment somehow captures Everything. I'm glad you pointed that out because that's like such a moving scene for me. I'm afraid we do have to end it, but uh, maybe if you have a desperate need to ask a question, we yeah, can d do it in the hall. But thank you guys so much for coming. Yeah, sorry for the. Uh... Congrats on the film. Yeah. Remember to vote. <laughs> <laughs>